I say, you know, obviously I'm not Grant Valentine, so couldn't make it to come. <laughs> so I, I took his role today. So today we got Dr. Uh, Andy Chris from CSI role uh, to present for our seminar. Uh, Dr. Chris is a chemical engineering engineer with extensive experience in biology and slurry handling. Uh, he worked for 20 years at IMIT University and 8 years at CSIO. So uh, he is specialized in rheologically characterizing a wide range of materials, particularly multi-phase uh, mixtures, concentrated suspensions and shear thickening uh, suspensions. In addition, he has uh, led the development of several new instruments for fluid characterization. He has conducted research into turbulent flow of non-Newtonian suspensions in open channels as part of a wide uh, project studying beaching angles, uh, setting of suspensions on the shear slip effects in uh, slip effects in shear thickening suspensions. So today he's going to talk about tail disposition and the science of small channels. Please join me with welcome to the and <coughs> Um, yes, so I'm from CSRO Minerals down in Melbourne, and I appreciate the weather up here. Nice, nice. Um, a few weeks ago, I think you had, uh, a few weeks back, a few months ago, you had a presentation from Andreas Monch, who's also from uh, CSRO Minerals. He gave the bit of a hard sell on what we do and all our capabilities. I won't be doing that today. Um, it's pretty good talking about some of the projects we've been doing. Um, also, that's the place where Christian Antonio came from, so it's his, uh, sort of his invitation uh, brought me up here. Uh, to kick off your weekend in the most exciting way I can. So this is a very much uh, a fluid flow um, and particles in fluids type of presentation. Um, it may or may not be uh, familiar to you, so if there's anything that it all makes perfect sense to me, which sort of characterises my odd personality, but um, if there's anything that does not make sense, just shout out as we go along. Hopefully it'll all make a degree of sense. Um, a lot of the work that we do in our particular group in minerals is not, um, we do have people that work on value chain, as many of you do. A lot of the stuff that we do in tailings, obviously, is not part of the value chain. It's the back end. It's the really, we don't want this anymore sort of material. Now, of course, there is a, a push and a trend to try and reassess what's in various tailings uh, dumps uh, to see do they actually have any valuable assets in them. That's not what uh, we're particularly about. We're just concerned about the um, aspects of how do we store tailings, because we call them, call them TSFs, not actual tailings dams, but tailings storage facilities. We're keeping it there for a later date, to see what happens. Now, tailings, uh, TSFs, tailings storage facilities, have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as we increase our mining uh, practices around the world. There has been a certain amount of concern, and very, very justified concern, about the number of them that do uh, collapse every now and again with uh, devastation to the surrounding countryside and loss of life. Uh, Brazil was the most, uh, San Marco in Brazil was the most recent one. Also we think of Mount Polly in Canada as well. These are two fairly spectacular examples. And, and that does make people very uh, concerned and anxious about uh, what we do with Chains Dent and it's a good reason for that. But well, we do need to look at that in context. Um, the number of uh, mine uh, tailing plans failures we have compared to the number of mines we have, has dropped off very, very significantly. So the technology is not broken, but it does certainly need a lot of improvement. So what we uh, look at in uh, our approach to uh, tailings management, if you want to reduce the size of dams, you want to reduce the amount of water they're storing, which means we have a, a more highly concentrated material in there, which is therefore slightly more difficult to create and transport and to process, and then to deposit. But it, hopefully it will be worth it. If we do reduce the, um, the risk of a dam failure, that improves our standings and social <coughs> license to operate. And also if we reduce the volume of material that's going to a TSF, then we can increase the life of the TSF. And that is of real value to a mine operator. We can talk about the value of water recovery. That's also very important uh, for a lot of reasons. But economically, it isn't always that important to a mine operator. And unless you can drive a mine operator with either bare economics or SLO, you're not going to get them to do anything. 
So some of the things we'll talk about today, the overarching context is that there is a drive to reduce the volume of material going to TSFs. One of the ways to do that is to decrease the amount of water um, that goes to, <coughs> go to the TSF, the thickener, before it goes out. And then we are left with the material, which is a little bit more difficult to handle than we had before. So, for those of you who have never seen a daylight stand before, we'll show some pictures and some diagrams. And again, many of you may have, but we'll just go through it anyway. So essentially what we're, we're concerned about is the everything after the thickener, after the final tailing thickener, which sure goes out through the underflow, gets pumped to a tailing storage facility. Now there are many different varieties, um, but generally we have material discharged at the high end, it runs down a bit of a slope, and then we have water pooling at the bottom, which is then pumped off and sent back to the plant. That's everything in a very simple way. Uh, we have other aspects to it. We have drying and dusting and drainage and seepage and acid mine drainage and all those other aspects. That's not really what we're looking at today. What we're looking at is how we can get the most material into that TSF and how we can get it there in a stable way. And that all comes down to understanding and controlling the beach. Not that beach. <laughs> so clearly I look much more comfortable on this beach than I did on the other one. This is a particularly odd beach. This is in uh, Arizona. And what we have here, hang on. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the uh, spigot where we have uh, discharged our tailings. Now they all, uh, with the after it's been pumped from the thickener, this can be hundreds of metres or several kilometres from the main site, uh, transported. And in this particular case, we have a perimeter discharge. We have a series of spigots all the way around, pumping into what we call a plunge pool. Now, as the material comes out from the uh, pipe, there's a whole lot of velocity and energy in that, and that's all dissipated in that very, uh, it's a self-formed dissipative uh, pool, not one you'd want to go swimming in. And there's a, a space at various distances up and down the perimeter of that particular TSF. And it just, uh, this is obviously not operating in that area at the moment. The way this particular TSF works is they'll pour in a, a particular section and then move on and move on and move on. So you get an even discharge. So we have, um, coming out of that plunge pool, when it's operating, we have a small channel. And this is the focus of what I, I'm talking about today. That is, we'll show better pictures of that later, but coming out of the plunge pool, everything pours in, violent boiling, pours out very gently into a channel. Because it likes peace and quiet. It runs all the way down to the far end, where you can see there's a, I'm enhanced a bit, there's a nice blue patch where the water runs off. This is a very, um, very shallow, uh, uh, very shallow TSF. This beach on that sl the slope on that uh, beach is less than half a percent. It's very, very. Um, it's due to having an unthinking material in, and it tends to suit what the process would be doing. Um, that's what the channel looks like uh, when it's, this is a dead channel. Obviously, we have no material flowing through it. Um, but again, it's about 300 to 500 millimeters <coughs> wide. It's less than 100 millimeters deep. Um, this is, again, we can go through a few different sites and see that um, the closer you look at them, the more channels you see. This is Murrin Murrin, it's a nickel mine in Western Australia. Again, we have perimeter discharge in either of those two um, paddocks. We have spigots pouring in, and then it all runs down in channels. This is, um, I'm going to sort of at the beginning, this is Los Tartalos in, in Chile. Yes, we go there too. Um, and what you can see here is uh, a channel running all the way through, and, and you can see where it's bifurcated and done a few different things. And this is another interesting picture for a, an interesting picture for another reason, in that when people talk about mine planning, I'll very optimistically say that yes, we had this particular TSF, it's going to last the next 30 years of mine life. Well, clearly that's not working too well for them here, they've started to bury their um, electrical power supply line. So planning, bold statements, don't always go where you want them to. So in this particular one, we have uh, deposition or we have a discharge along this embankment here, which is a, a dam wall. That dam wall is uh, built up uh, continuously by centrifuging the tannins material. The tannins material, that you can't see the centrifuges are off to the, the right. The tannins material is uh, centrifuged, the fines are then sent out to the TSF. The coarse material is then used to rebuild and constantly build uh, what's called an upstream raise, sorry, downstream raise in this case, for the, um, 
for the damn ball to continuously build it up. And that is an expensive process. And that is the most, uh, or the greatest expense for the uh, operation of the TSF of this type, is the continuous earthwork that's needed to keep building up the wall. And if we can reduce that uh, expense, then we have the interest of our mine operator. That doesn't talk to the science at all, but that's does fund the science. So, if we go on. Now, this is another type of uh, TSF. This is essentially thickened discharge. Well, the thickening isn't done centrally, but the discharge is. So, previously we talked about the perimeter discharge. In this particular case, we have a ramp with a pipe going to the centre, and we then discharge down radially down here. So, this this produces these nice little cones everywhere. Um, you'll notice that these are all in Australia. This is a popular technique in areas of Australia which are dry and flat. It doesn't work in hilly regions so well. It doesn't work, certainly does not work in tropical regions. Uh, the advantage of this method is that we have minimal or no wall around the outside. There are no earthworks required other than occasionally rebuilding that ramp in the middle as you get bigger and bigger. There's a huge advantage to doing that in terms of reducing the cost of construction. There are many disadvantages to running it in terms of um, if you're trying to work in a high rainfall area or if you don't have that very large area of flat ground. So, um, so going back to um, this is again, this is Los Cartales. This is our, the beginning of our channel. So if you remember the picture before, we had a plunge pool. So there's a similar thing occurring here with a discharge. There's a period of very meandering um, all over the place type of uh, flow here. But then we get into a relatively straight, and this is one example, but there are many other examples where we get very, very straight channels occurring. And this is where um, we start to get our method of uh, determining how the beach is going to behave, how the beach is going to grow. This was noticed um, some decades ago by one of the uh, geotechnical consultants and uh, Australian Town consultants, a man called Paul Williams. Um, who <coughs> noticed that every time they had this type of discharge, that channels were formed. If you think about pouring out a slurry, your immediate idea is that it would just go out in a huge sheet and a big flow, as water does. They do that initially, but after a while they stop doing that. And the reason for that is we have not hard ground that's been poured onto, but we have soft ground. All of this is wet, soft tailings. It has a yield stress, you have to put a certain amount of stress to it before it will deform, that's not a very high yield stress because we have a very high water content. Um, it is saturated in most cases. So the new tailings that are poured into it cut a channel through it. And so he noticed that and he thought, well, I'm sort of a civil engineer and civil engineers understand channels really, really well because we've been doing this since the 19th century and we've got equations for this. And part of that equation is that the channel slope is related to the flow rate and um, if we have a particular flow rate, we should get a particular channel slope out of that. And that was the beginning of his idea as to how the slope of the, of the particular beach is dictated by the channel. And of course, if we get a steeper slope, we get a greater volume of uh, dry material, solid material, into our TSF, which is what we want. So if we can work out a way of modelling that channel, which tells us what the slope will be for a given set of conditions, then we can predict and possibly manipulate how the beach slope will occur. And that was his idea. Problem is, um, there's a few too many assumptions involved in that. So, he's looking at non-segregating tailings. So these are the tailings that, um, by civil engineers or geotechnical engineers definition, you don't get size um, sorting as you pour as material flows. So the, big, the large particles stay with small particles. And that's very important for a particular beach that we're looking at. We also assume that we have total transport of the solids, what goes in one end comes out the other end. Because if you don't, you're going to start getting um, an, a varying slope as you go through. And the, the key idea is that the channels form at what we would call the minimum conveying slope, or minimum conveying angle. Now in pipeline transport, we talk about a minimum conveying velocity. If we have a slurry of some kind, be it water with sand, or be it a non-Newtonian uh, clay-based material with sand in it as well, some type of <coughs> material. There is a minimum velocity for a given pipe diameter and a given set of particle and rheology conditions that you have to flow to keep particles off the bottom of the pipe. 
That's good. Above this minimum velocity, everything is fully suspended. Below that, it starts to form a bed, get dragged along, and then slowly build up to a static bed, and then more. So, in channels, we don't have a minimum conveying velocity so much as the minimum conveying slope. There has to be a particular slope which everything formed at, or else it's not going to flow through. It's all going to collapse. Um, so, that was, again, the key thing we need to work out. But one of, the, one of the important things that was missing from the very basic channel equation, well, two things were missing. One was the assumption of Newtonian behaviour, because all those channel equations are worked out for water, and we very clearly don't have water. We have a slurry. And the other thing was they didn't know what the channel shape was, and that's, that allows us to calculate our hydraulic radius and then fit into our equation. So these were two things we didn't know. But this was... Uh, in his mind, demonstrated to be qualitatively correct, and the various other people have worked on this project and said this this works. This is an idea. Well, unfortunately, we haven't actually demonstrated that it's correct. There is anecdotal evidence, and there's gut feel, and there's a lot of business interest riding on the idea that it's qualitatively correct. But we really don't have a good scientific basis that says yes, it is, and we don't have a very strong predictive mechanism that can demonstrate that we can get this right most of the time or every time. So that's what we need to work on. What, is the, what are the fundamental and important aspects of this process? And there are many, many aspects of this process. It gets a little confusing at times, it's very confusing at other times, but we have to work out which ones are necessary. So in this particular model of um, beach slopes, we can say the flow rate is a function of the slope of the channel, of the hydraulic radius, so again, because we're working with channels, not pipes, we don't talk about the diameter of the radius of the channel. We talk about uh, a ratio between um, the perimeter, the wetted perimeter, and the um, frontal surface area of the flow. That's our equivalent. And we look at viscous dissipation. That's based around what are the rheological parameters of the material. So we need to know something about that. And we need to be able to measure slope as a function of the flow conditions, the particle correct characteristics, be it density, size, height size distribution, and the rheology of the material. Um, and we can do that in um, something we call a channel ring, some sort of uh, form of uh, that looks like a channel, and we can make that something that we can tilt the slope and do that. So various um, research projects have, have tried that. Um, again, with, uh, I was working with Paul within some years ago. We built, they built a, a very large uh, rig that took that to site, and they were pouring tannins in, and they were watching channels actually form in their very large rig. And that was useful, but as soon as you tried to do any measurements on it, the channels would just disappear. They're very, very uh, flighty. So we needed a different version of that, which we'll talk about later. Um, also, we need to look at uh, the slope as a function of this spatial position, or its radial position down the TSF. There's another thing that was noted was the slope is not constant. It gives a concavity to the beach. Beach concavity uh, is another problem because that means we're deviating from that nice conical shape, which gives us our maximum volume for storing our solid material, and we're digging out the center, so we are losing a lot of, um, a lot of behavior. So even if we do have a channel model that works, we need a channel model that can, that can accommodate this um, other variation as well. So again, another layer of complication. This could be due to a few things, um, such as a variation in the, channel, in the channel shape, which we haven't discussed much yet, or underflow variability. So what's coming out of the, um, the final thickness, the tailings thickness before it discharges the TSF? If that's showing variation, that may be one of the causes of why we're getting variation. So these are the com complicating factors, which is why it's very hard to demonstrate that even if you do have a good model of channel behaviour, does it actually match what we do see on the TSF? We'll go through that <clears throat> in a little bit more detail. Um, and underflow variability, we know that exists because anyone who's ever tried to operate a thickener or has seen the data that comes out of any sort of thickener knows that it is not flat line. It is up and down all the time. There are variations in uh, biometric flow rate, there are variations in density, and it's a horrible thing. Okay. We also need to think of the, um, the slope as a function of what are the conditions on the TSF. How well drained is it? Where is our free attic level? Do we have, as we saw in the, um, the Los Patales example before, very, very uh, wet surface, uh, pretty much all the way down, so a saturated material that we're cutting through? Or do we have things like on some of those uh, simply discharged uh, examples we saw? Of course they are in 
WA, so it's quite dry, but they do have a very uh, dry um, uh, material that they're cutting through. So it's quite a different set of conditions there that, that will, again, have an effect on the shape and an effect on our slope. So these are all the things we need to consider. So talking about how the um, effect of uh, underflow variation would cause some of our uh, variability <coughs> in our slope. Uh, this particular graph here, this is some data that we've taken from looking at a particular tailings uh, thickness. So taking three months worth of data and compiling it down to um, some very wobbly statistics, we're looking at the variation in flow rate. So obviously down here, we're talking we're partly shut down, but we're still dribbling through. Uh, here is where uh, most of our, the, well, the mean of the mean of our data is coming through, and here's a few high points. So we're getting quite a very wide range of um, tons of material coming through per hour. So one of the um, aspects of our channel model was that we do have um, a, a function of volumetric flow rate, and various bits of uh, experimentation has indicated that for certain conditions. The faster you go, the um, shallower the slope becomes. And that's been, that fits in with our very basic channel equation, it fits in with some of the experiments we conducted on site. Um, so what that looks like, and again, some more stunning animation coming up here. This is our spigot, and it's discharging into our plunge pool, and running out of that is our particular material. So for this particular flow rate, everything else unchanged, we will get that particular slope. Uh, that, of course, is an exaggeration. We don't make slopes that steep, but make it easier to see. So if you go to a high flow rate, we'll get a, a shallower slope. And again, and if you try lower, it get becomes steeper and steeper and steeper. So what we get, if we overlay that, if we get this variation with time, we can then see that sometimes we'll get a steep behaviour, sometimes we'll get shallow behaviour, and it may, over time, average out to get this nice concave behaviour. So that, in that sense, the channel model does provide a method of um, understanding why we may get concavity, but we still need to test that against some actual data. And again, compare that with what would happen with channel shape. So, not being able to see into what the channels are doing, we've had to base it on some of the dead channels, like the one you <coughs> saw before in the picture. We found that they're, they're of a certain very flat um, parabola type shape. Um, we can also look at that based on some of the, um, of the river type models we would have as to what shape a river should take. Again, there's a few assumptions in that. But we can modify that and we get a reasonably um, workable equation. And again, with a few underlying assumptions. If we look at a particular material, uh, we're now looking at, for a constant, um, everything else being constant, we're now looking at uh, changing the weight fraction of solids. Now we're actually looking at the conditions of the deposited material, not the actual flowing material. So once the material that we've, we've seen um, that has formed a slightly damp or very damp uh, or saturated uh, recently deposited tailings, they have a particular set of properties and if their yield stress is going to be similar to any sort of uh, highly concentrated slurry. So as we have an increase, we expect to see an increase in yield stress, and we would also expect to see a minimum, um, a change in the minimum conveying velocity of the material passing through it. So that would, again, if we go to a very high uh, concentration, we get a very, very steep channel, and we can calculate that, yes, if we go to lower and lower concentrations, we become broader and flatter. And until the point where we do almost get a form of sheet flow, um, as, as it was a very, very dilute material. So, if we find a method or a mechanism which would give us the variation in um, channel, uh, channel shape across the, um, across the beach, and that's quite reasonable if we were to get a uh, more or less saturated material as we went to um, the different depths, uh, we would then see that effect as well. So this is another possible means of giving us concavity. So that's um, in our profile. So, Again, both based on the channel idea, but still not really tied down to any one particular mechanism. Okay, so, and so, as I said, the effect on, on the, um, of the change in profile, of change in the properties of tailings, if we do get changes in um, level, uh, levels of clay or types of clay in, in the material, we'll get different effects as well. And, as we said before, variations, saturation will change that. 
Um, so, why is this um, of any any great use? Well, if we need to um, model our channels, we need to get uh, context right. We need to know that a particular model, a simple model of the channel may not work. But we also need to look at um, the actual modeling of the channel we're using itself. As I said before, we looked at a uh, used a very and initially used a very simple channel model, which is based on that for water. And again, like I said, it's been done since the 19th century and beyond, or before. And that gives us a very good way of designing water bearing channels. It's been extended to very dilute slurries and with a certain bit of modification, it sort of works there. And that works better for large channels. But what we're doing is we're dealing with non Newtonian fluid and we're dealing with a very small channel. And the reason why that's different <coughs> is partly demonstrated in this little diagram. This is conceptually what happens in a large channel. When you get to wide enough channels, you can treat it as a two-dimensional problem. You have at the bed, you invert, uh, you have zero velocity at the wall, going up to an almost even, or logarithmic and an almost even constant value of uh, velocity. And that's the same across the width of the channel, except where you get to the edges. The edges are a small proportion of your flow, they don't matter so much. We have near the wall, we have what we call the viscous sublayer. So even though we're flowing very fast with our dilute material, we have turbulence, fully developed turbulent flow here where everything is um, not moving in streamlines, it's all quite uh, uh, full of eddies, there's lots of different direction flow and it's very good for suspending materials. When we get down to here, we have our viscous sublayer. So at the wall, whether you're in a pipe, whether you're in a channel, big or small, you'll have a viscous sublayer near the wall where there is no turbulent flow. There is only flow in streamlines in the direction, in the axial direction. That is not so good for suspending material. But in most cases, that's quite small. It's a very small um, portion of a pipe or a, or a channel. And usually, particles will be bigger than the actual viscous sublayer so they do get suspended. In the case of channels, it's not quite so. It can actually get to be quite big. And we can have um, a very big viscous sublayer, which then complicates how we get transport going. But anyway, that's the model for large channels. <coughs> when we go to smaller channels, we can't make that assumption about the ends don't matter. The ends are pretty well near the middle. So we're now getting additional effects, such as secondary flows, plus we have an additional wall, which is giving us an additional um, shear gradient across our channel. So, um, while we would like to use what's hap what the, the equations and the models that have been built for channels over many years, they don't work so well and we need to start again and look at what is happening in, in small channels. So we build a big one. This is um, a tilting rig. This is originally developed for pipeline flow. This is at our, our, it's when it was at its, our site in Hyatt and it's been moved to our, our site at Clayton. Um, <coughs> that's that particular um, bed there can tilt up to 90 degrees. Now, we don't do that for channels, obviously, but we do that for pipeline flows. There's a 100 millimeter um, pipeline or a 150 millimeter pipeline there, which can also um, which go, well, it's 20 meters out and 20 meters back. So that was the original work for that particular uh, tilting rig um, to look at what are the effects of uh, different topographies that a pipeline would flow over and look at density currents as they occur. We've used it to build a channel on it and then do our channel work on that. Now, we've actually got a pipe here, which the observant amongst you have noticed is not a channel. However, if you do run the pipe in slack flow, as in you don't fill it up completely, you just run the material down the bottom of the pipe, it's a channel. Um, and we have various observation ports along here. And we've been able, we pump material through, a slurry material through, we can monitor that. And I'll show you some of the instrumentation as we go. That's where a lot of our instrumentation sits back in the middle. And that's a rough diagram. So, yes, slurry out tank, stir it to get everything suspended. Um, we're using a slurry centrifugal pump through a magnetic flow meter, so we do know what our volumetric flow rate is. Pumped up to this uh, weir, it's a stilling box. So, you remember the first thing that happens when the material comes out of the spigot on the TSF, it goes into plunge pool and all the energy is dissipated, well we need to 
uh, replicate that. And so we dissipate all the um, pipeline uh, kinetic energy that's in the slurry, and then we just have gravitational flow. So then that, that very quickly develops a steady state. It's a 300 millimeter diameter channel. That doesn't mean that our, oh sorry, 300 millimeter diameter pipe. That doesn't mean that our channels are at uh, 300 millimeters uh, for a hydraulic radius or even the width. They will usually sit in the very, um, very bottom of the pipe. So they're quite, quite shallow, again, less than 100 millimeters. Very similar to what we've seen on TSS. We have um, two ultrasonic depth gauges. So they are measuring the height of the, um, the flow. So we need them to be equal because we know if we do have a slope that's not equal to the slope of the channel, then we have a, an incorrect energy gradient and we don't have a steady state flow going on. Or we have deposition or something else happening. More about that later. Uh, we also have ERT electrodes. And this is for measuring ERT electro-resistive tomography as a method of uh, measuring concentration across the um, the flow circle, the flow area, and that gives us an indication when material is being deposited or when it's being fully suspended. So these are the parts of the instrumentation. Later on, we'll also look at our uh, UDP transducers, where we measure the velocity profiles across. So that's a really heavily instrumented channel. Um, that's the advantage of uh, assuming uh, on the basis of some reasonably good measurements that the channel shape will be something like this and then using a rigid channel rather than its own self-formed channel because the self-formed channels do fall apart as soon as you look at them so using a rigid channel we can heavily instrument it and then get uh, a very good idea of what's going on and so we see that in play and that's the uh, stilling here at the back and so that's looking from above this material instead of thundering out it does come out in a nice this is coming out of a nice sheet flow. That's because it's water. This is our, our middle section. And that's what the ERT output would look like. So that's, um, we can interpret that in terms of um, what the concentration gradient is across the uh, flow of the material. So this is, this will be the general shape of the whole liquid flow. This is a more concentrated um, solids material. So we do get a higher concentration towards the invert, towards the bottom of the channel, and it becomes less and less uh, concentrated as we go up. That's similar to pipes in a certain way, if pipes are operated in, in, a, in that particular flow region. Okay, and so what's the first thing we put in it? It's not tailings. The first thing we do is put in our own pseudo tailings reason for that is that we can control the flow characteristics better. Also, we can create a transparent material which allows us to look, um, look through it and see what's going on. Also, it's a material where we can put a, a ultrasonic uh, velocity measurement through. If we have too many, too many particles in it, the, the diffraction becomes a problem and we can't get an accurate measure out of that. So what we do is we create a, uh, a fluid in two parts. If you think of a, any sort of real tailings material, there's the very fine material and there's the coarse material. Now where um, people consider that uh, division to occur is depends on how people operate or what their end purpose is. Often it's the case of this is the smaller sieve size we use so everything below that is fine so everything above is coarse. We look at it in terms of what is rheologically active and what is the material which needs to be transported. In the tailings material, we have water, dissolved salts, and clay and rock flour. So everything that's very, very small, less than about 10 micrometers, is easily suspended or dissolved. So we have, you can just run that at whatever speed you like, and very little or nothing will drop out of that. As we go above in size, we have material which would then needs to be transported, but has minimal effect on the rheology. You can add more and more and more of it. It doesn't really affect the rheology much until you get to very high concentrations. So we take that conceptual split of what the material is, and we then recreate that in our physical analog. Um, the carrier material, which is a uh, non-Newtonian, usually a yield pseudoplastic material, so it has a yield stress, but it's shear thinning. Um, we create, recreate that with an aqueous polymer called carbopol. We use that for a large number of our pipeline tests and our channel tests. We can create a material of a wide range of different yield stresses from the, you can walk on it almost, to the, um, it's very, very runny, and just barely has any stress. So we do that wide range of materials. Then we start adding back in the coarse fraction. 
And in this particular case, um, we've used it as sand. Um, so then, just to recap, we had the two parts of it. So we have the everything which is clay and fines is represented by the uh, copper pole, and everything which is the conveyor material we put into coarse sand. And we can get um, some very good replication of a tailings behavior with that material. We would we can actually characterize tailings in the same way by measuring the sieving out all the coarse material, <coughs> measuring what the fine uh, give us, and we can replicate that with copper pole, and then put in a similar type of PSD for the, the coarse material. So the section we highlighted before where we put our UDVP in, uh, this is uh, three points where we have a UDVP probe coming up. We have two points on the side where we get the cross, um, the uh, right angle version of that as well. So we get a fully uh, characterized uh, flow velocity. So we're not just interested in the center line, we want to see what is happening to the edges as well, because being a small channel, the edges are important. Also, we put in a UDVP probe from the top. This is further downstream, so it doesn't disrupt the upstream ones. And that <coughs> probably put in too low, but that should just be touching the top of the surface, and that gives us the reciprocal um, measurement. Because if we do have particles in there, we do lose our signal very quickly. So if we want to get a surface measurement, we thought that would be a better idea. That didn't work. I'm not too proud to say that we do sometimes make mistakes. That, um, that particular measurement was too disruptive of the flow, so we had to pull it out. And to stick with that to five, we had below. Also, when we get to very um, low flow rates or very steep angles, we get very shallow channels, so not all of these are operated all the time. We always ran with, the, we were able to always run with a minimum of two measurements, um, and in some cases, up to five. And that produced something that looks a little bit like this. Now, a little confusing. But that's the center line velocity. That's the, this is the direction of flow is going into the, into the screen. So and this is the, the depth. And we have, I have slightly squished that up. So that is a much flatter um, channel profile. The reality is a much flatter channel profile than we see here. So we have the, um, the center line here. We have the going across that right angle's velocity. So it's a very bull-nosed particular look there. Um, as we go further to right to the wall, we see that we get less variation in our flow. And somewhere in between the center and the wall, we have this interesting effect where we get the profile curling over. Now, that's something we've seen uh, a few times before when we've measured actual tailings um, flows. And it's an interesting phenomenon. It's also known in, sometimes seen in, in river flows as well. But what we're looking at here is a secondary flow. So instead of just all the uh, fluid heading in that direction, we're getting fluid coming up and going around in circles centered on the axis of the pipe. So we have two separate flows going like that, bringing in um, slow moving fluid from the bottom and then mixing that with the fast moving fluid at the top. So normally where the maximum and the velocity would be at the surface, we have the maximum slightly below the surface. And that was an interesting phenomenon that we noted. It does uh, add to one more reason why small channels behave differently to big channels. That's an important one. It becomes less important as we go to more dilute materials and higher flow rates with the turbulence, then mixes all that in together. So we tend to get a more even behavior as we go to very high turbulence. We'll see a little later. Uh, okay. So the different, um, we looked at various um, different concentrations of carbon pole to produce different rheologic rheologies in our carrier fluid. So we're going from what we'll, this is our R1 fluid down to our R4 fluid. And <coughs> this is a quite viscous carbon pole. Um, it still flows very easily through the channel, but it has a, a moderate yield stress. Down to this one, which has almost no yield stress. That's to the, yeah, that's really down the limits of our measurement. So it either has a very small yield stress or no yield stress at all. So between these two, we looked at what the different behaviors were. And we are able to get some different types of flow profiles. So these are the results of our UDVP um, uh, velocity measurements. This is only the center line velocity that we're looking at here. Um, it becomes a little bit too complex if we look at the other velocities as well. So, the R1 fluid, which is our high yield stress viscous material, 
we have uh, uh, this is some layer down here uh, variation and then constant velocity with depth which is interesting down to the lowest costing material the R4 which has constant variation all the way through so that particular um, behavior I should point out that this is all normalized velocity so they actually the low for the same conditions, the lower um, <coughs> viscosity material flows faster and the lower depth, but these are all being normalized with depth and, and bulk velocity, so we can get them all into one graph. Um, what we have here is an unsheared plug. So there's actually a, while well, all this is being sheared and it's quite vigorously active, this is a unsheared plug. So the material is moving like a gel down the center of the channel. Everything else around it is flowing, moving active. This is just one transported slug down the center. So that sounds like a very weird phenomenon, but it's not um, unknown. Uh, we do get that in pipelines as well. We do get the center of it with a high yield stress material. The center of the pipe can also be unsheared. Um, it only works either temporarily or it exists temporarily or it only exists for homogeneous fluids, one with that particles in them. And I should emphasize there are no particles in this at the moment. Uh, we, we see that and it has also been observed in some of the channel tests that have been done on site, in, uh, uh, particularly at the Chukia Master site, where they set up a very large uh, channel rig with real tailings going through, and they noticed that there was a, an unsheared uh, plug in the middle. So that does tend to um, fit with what they've seen for very viscous material. Um, however, there are a few problems with that. If you are dealing with a unsheared material, you're probably dealing with laminar flow throughout the rest of your uh, velocity profile, which means uh, you have trouble suspending your material. So if you remember back to the turbulence diagram, we do need vigorous turbulence to try and keep our material suspended, and if we have laminar flow, material tends to drop out. So that matches what has been seen, but it does give us difficulties in explaining how it can actually convey material. So, if we look at a different uh, slope, different angle, that previous one was half a degree, this one is now two degrees, we see quite different behaviour. Yes, the order is still the same in the, in the viscous material, it does approach constant, um, constant velocity behaviour, but not quite so rapidly, and we never see that with the low viscosity material. So, this is another complication between pipes and channels, if you want to use all the paradigms that have been uh, collected for pipes and trying to transfer that to a small channel, it doesn't work terribly well because we have the variation of slope as well that changes the structure of our flow. We don't, the same patterns don't occur um, from one, from, if you get the channel exactly the same, uh, it doesn't have the same patterns as you would with a pipe. A pipe has the, you can repeat patterns and use you know, your established modeling for that. Every time you do something with a channel, it changes and the modeling needs to change I'm just bringing up complication on complication on it. has a happy ending. We also managed to look at um, turbulent uh, velocity measurements. I'm not going to do this too much, but when we, um, when we measure a steady, steady flow velocity, you can understand what that is. But when we look at turbulent uh, intensity, we also measure the fluctuation. So with the a constant velocity component, there's also a fluctuating, slightly faster, slightly slower, over a very high frequency that occurs. We can measure that as well. And so when we look at a highly viscous material, there is a minimal um, uh, velocity fluctuation. And when we go to uh, low viscous material, we get this type of uh, bull nose pattern, which, we, which we've seen in pipelines and, and other channels before. So that's quite understandable and acceptable. So greater turbulent behavior closer to the wall, much less turbulence at the top, which is what you expect. What we didn't expect was that we would get any turbulence at all than what we um, find, which we expect to be or have otherwise determined to be a laminar flow. <coughs> it's not really uh, a turbulent effect. It's as effectively secondary flows bringing in material, as we said before, from the, from the walls and dumping that in again. So we get that's being misinterpreted by the data or by the equipment as being turbulence as well. So another fun thing. So we try and look at that in terms of um, some standard <coughs> uh, fluid engineering's uh, approach to how to understand turbulence. 
Um, we look at wall units, and so there's a particular pattern that all sorts of flows have, whether it's near a flat surface or whether it's in a pipe or whatever, that uh, as we go very close to the wall, we can uh, reinterpret that. And we have a viscous sublayer looks like that, and then the logarithmic section above looks like that. That didn't quite fit anything that we should. Um, but then we were able to bring in the variation of that particular equation. The way they, where those equations worked out, they're, they're normalised based on the shear stress of the wall. For our channels, we don't have a constant shear stress of the wall. So we were able to uh, look at the shear stress based at the invert, and we were um, recalculated those values, and we've got a much better fit. Not a perfect fit, but a much better fit. Um, if we look at the, <coughs> the red ones, now we're looking at the, um, the low viscosity material, that does fit our expectations. The slightly higher viscosity material is um, the R3 material. That doesn't fit as well. The R1, R2 are completely off the, off the chart, didn't fit at all. Uh, so we have one which does, one which doesn't. And that just tends to indicate that we have um, some approaching fully developed uh, turbulent flow with our low viscosity material and a much less uh, developed turbulence for our even slightly higher viscosity. This gives us um, some indication as to what's going to happen when it comes to suspending solids in our channel and what effect that will have on the minimum conveying slope. So we then need to look at, uh, this is our, we've got our turbulent velocity profiles and our velocity profiles with uh, no solids in the channel. The next move is to put solids into the channel and see uh, do we get a change in our velocity profiles and do we get a change, in, or can we start looking at when deposition occurs? Because when deposition occurs, that's when the channel is over, it's finished and that dictates the minimum conveying uh, slope that we have. It becomes an important measurement. So the ways we looked at it, we have uh, the depth gauges, the ultrasonic depth gauges. <coughs> when they're not equal or they're indicating that we don't have a constant slope, then we know we're getting deposition. We have deposition probes. Um, there are a particular set of electrodes we put on the bottom of the channel and they detect the presence of uh, particles moving past them. them. ERT. Uh, ERT wasn't terribly useful in this particular set of trials. Uh, we also have delivered solids concentration where we would measure the uh, concentration of material being delivered. Uh, if it's a nice constant uh, value, you uh, expect that that's going to continue conveying like that. When you start to see variations in that, that indicates we're getting deposition. Observation, because we have lots of holes cut in our pipe, stroke the channel, we can see when uh, deposition occurs. And we can also measure the PSD of the material. See, do we get segregation before we get deposition? All those sorts of things. So we put in 10 volume uh, percent of uh, 180 micrometer sand. Um, sort of makes it equivalent to a 45 to 55 weight percent slurry, depending on the density of the material we're trying to uh, replicate. And some of the outcomes were uh, uh, well interesting. Uh, this is our ultrasound get gauge. So on the left we have um, yeah, this one's the R5 and R6 fluid. They were the same as the three and the four. So, uh, so, the, yeah. so this is the, the, the very low viscosity material. This is the slightly higher viscosity material. So here we have effectively the same uh, slope, so, or effectively a constant slope, where we have effectively the same depth. Here we have a very different um, depth between the two points that we're measuring at. So we have um, a, well, we have basically a lake with, a, with an angle on it, which is good for water skiing, but not much else. Uh, so that means we've got deposition occurring and then our channel is, is not conveying. <coughs> and what we found was that we could not get this particular material to convey at, with any of the fluids that were more viscous than the R4, so in this case the R6. So there's only the very low viscosity material was able to generate sufficient turbulence to carry material forward. So what that indicates is that trying to convey in laminar flow is not going to work terribly well. If at all, it will work for a very short distance, but you are going to get segregation and deposition very, very quickly. So that does call into question some of the testing that we saw on site at Chikimata. And is that, uh, is that effectively representing what does happen on the TSF? Um, if it appears that I'm going to get more questions than I'm providing answers to, then that's probably a very good perception. Uh, so that's what we saw from our um, depth measurement. Similarly, um, this is just an example of the output from our, our deposition probes. So we have two of them and we can get a cross-correlation between uh, 
is where the uh, where we are getting particles passing through. We can then get a, a, a velocity distribution of particles. And these are particles which are very close to the wall. So when we don't have any deposition occurring, we just get a fuzzy signal. When we start getting um, particles close to the wall, consistently moving past these electrodes, we get a coherent signal, which we can then interpret as a velocity of the particles uh, in the bed. So we'll see those graphs a bit later. We took all that data, plus some others, and we put that uh, in this particular form. So here we are looking at channel slope. So remember, we're trying to determine the minimum conveying slope. We're varying the slope for a given uh, fixed volumetric flow going through. And here we have our near wall velocity, which is measured by our deposition probes. And we see that, um, looking here, this is our liquid concentration, it is relatively constant for a whole range of slopes. It does drop here a little bit. It does drop dramatically here. And we see our near wall velocity decreasing quite evenly until we get to this point here when we see a massive drop off. So <clears throat> that was our method of determining what the minimum conveying velocity was for these conditions. Um, and it was interesting, we saw uh, a slight uh, segregation occurring about. So a slight size segregation occurring as well. Even though the sand we had was a reasonably narrow um, particle size distribution, it did start to uh, start delivering only fine particles and the uh, large particles were starting to drop out of the channel at this point. So it was interesting and useful for us because everything occurred at the same time. Um, we also have a uh, <coughs> we'll skip over that one, I think. It's getting a bit too. Right. So what we also noticed was that in the um, in our UDVP, our velocity profiles were slightly different once we started putting particles in. And whereas before we had sort of behavior, and what we're looking at here is um, different volumetric flow rates from low to very high. So as we do that, the depth does get greater, as you expect, at a constant angle. But instead of being nice and monotonic, we now have this bump. Curve. And regardless of um, volumetric flow, it occurs at about the same depth, which was interesting to us. Um, because that particular point there is within the viscous sublayer. So we can see where our viscous sublayer is now got a bump in it with no obvious fluid flow reason for it. Um, and so we can see that if we plot the position where that bump is, um, and you know, that's a really crude line, so I wouldn't put too much to it. Uh, if we put the bed velocity, as measured by a deposition probe, against our, those local maxima, the little bumps, we see that they're moving not necessarily at the same speed, because we're not necessarily measuring at the same depth, but we do get a relationship. And I'm not saying that um, we're implying causation here, but there is possibility that we are actually measuring something quite real, that there is um, material in a bed uh, on the bottom of the channel moving along. That's how we get some conveying. <clears throat> and to further that, we, no matter what conditions we were, as even though we went from a very wide range of um, different uh, volumes of flow rates, we still had that bump at the same height. So we're getting material sitting at about one or two grains height above the bottom of the invert and being dragged along. So it's no longer a fully suspended flow. Even though we still have full conveying of our material, which we thought would have been a fully suspended flow, we don't have a fully suspended flow. We have a bed, which is being a sliding bed, which is being dragged along by the rest of the flow. Still conveying material, but not as a fully suspended fashion. And that then brings up some very interesting uh, uh, concepts as to what does it mean as to where is the wall of the channel, because we have this very relatively dilute material flowing through our suspended, our, our, our central material, and now we have a transition from it's a flowing material to a flowing uh, bed of solids to an actual stationary bed of solids. So again, being it's slightly more complex, I'll skip over that. And then this is what it looks like when we look up the, uh, <coughs> when we look up the uh, pipe, or in this case the channel, this is at the point 
where it's about to stop conveying. So those particular um, bumps on the on the bottom of the velocity curve are there, and the what we see here is a very very odd waveform occurring. So that's not what you'd usually see. So we have another indication as to when we're about to start losing conveying, and gosh, no, look at that. All right. Okay. So then. What does this give us? This gives us um, three different categories of small channel. And I'm, is that clock right? Because I've been talking for a long time. Um, <laughs> I do apologize. I'll speed it up. Because um, you were meant to mention the team, and they don't know that yet, do they? Yeah. 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 Right. So we have, from all this, we get essentially three different types of um, small channel. We have a non settling suspension that, that represents sort of a, represented by our R1 material, the very viscous uh, material. So either through having high viscosity or very small particles, it doesn't settle out. So this is a sort of um, almost a paste-like material. You might see this in um, uh, some of the alumina uh, deposits with a very thick paste-like material. You won't get channelized flow. You won't get channelized flow because if there's no settling, you can't get a more concentrated bed for the material flow through. So it's all a reasonably consistent concentration. There's no differentiation between the stuff that's been there for a while and has settled and the stuff that's flowing through it. So you don't get tantalized flow if that occurs. You may get well, sheets occurring, as in almost like waves on the beach constantly pouring over each other and building up in that fashion. We then possibly have a viscous carrier with cool solids. So again, a more viscous material with some uh, uh, fairly large or dense particles which um, do not want to be conveyed easily, and if we don't have sufficient turbulence, uh, we will get settling. And again, it's all going to be a matter of uh, how turbulent and how uh, coarse the material is to see how far we do get transportation at all. So we may get a very, very short beach, a very short, steep beach occurring, or even segregation of particles. Um, and that may be uh, coincident with the observed uh, central plug in the, the yield stress, high yield stresses observe central plug of the material flowing from the channel. And then there's the one that we like to see, probably. We have a low viscosity carrier which can generate sufficient turbulence and that will suspend the particles that we have. It will give us a long constant beach which will allow us to get our most our uh, maximum volume into our TSF. <coughs> and there may be a sliding bed present with that. So needs to be a little bit more. What we do with this particular information? Well if we um, some of the stuff we're doing on site, potentially in the past, is we go up, we measure the rheologies, and we also measure the effect of um, varying the um, slurry as much as we can with polymers. So on, um, our on-site measurements use things such as our, our online rheometer, where we actually can get a full characterization of the material as a non-Newtonian. Also the things we do in the laboratory, where we have um, a lot of the uh, work we did as part of our Amira. Uh, project, recent project on tailings management. Um, we looked at the addition of polymers to tailings. Now, there's been lots of work over many years of adding polymers to uh, materials as they go into a thickener, and that has a particular effect on their uh, flocculation, agglomeration, and settling. And then there's another way of adding material, adding polymer material to a tailings as a porous composite, and that also varies its uh, viscosity and its settling behavior. And we've looked at that quite uh, quite extensively. And you can imagine if we are getting different flock sizes, we are going to get different um, rates of settling, which is going to affect how a beach occurs. And we've done that in quite a few ways. I'm going to keep skipping forward. So the complexity of our small channel behavior is probably um, the more significant uh, reason for the lack of success with current models that are used. Now there's Lots of um, consultants that go out and do design TSFs based on um, mainly their knowledge, but also you employ some of these models as well. I think the model is partly there as the man behind the curtain, uh, and it's really done in gut feel. So there's, there's a lot of gross simplifications that go into these models that they use, um, again, using Newtonian type behaviors or pseudo non Newtonian behaviors and not uh, absorbing what can really happen in a small channel. Uh, but what we do have, I think we do have a functional analogue for a TSF beach slope from small channel testing. 
or do we? Well, I'm probably slightly guilty of saying that it works just because it looks really good. What we really definitely do have is a very good model of small channels, but is that um, relatable to TSF? We still need to do a lot more uh, work on um, relating our measurement to what occurs on a TSF by measuring variations over time. So it's a project we've got to have and we'll get on to doing it. And we're going to do that. Okay, thank you.